OK, here we go. So again, my name is Carolina. I'm a career advisor at the Experiential Learning Hub. Um, what I didn't mention earlier before was that my portfolio focuses primarily on students in the Ontario Agricultural College, um, but I do see a good mix of students on any given day as well. Um, and since I took over this role, um, focusing on the Ontario Agricultural College a few years back, one of the questions that came at me hard and fast was what can I do besides be a veterinarian if I'm interested in animal work? Um, so quickly I realized this was a very important topic to many and one that people didn't seem to um, have a lot of information about. So I set off to try and do something about that and I've been learning a lot and I appreciate the opportunity to do so. And thank you to our panelists for being here today to continue to expand our efforts in this area. Um, so I'm assuming that a lot of you that are in attendance today are probably wondering the same thing, right? Maybe you had the idea of being a veterinarian once upon a time um, and perhaps for whatever reason, maybe that's no longer something that you are going to pursue or maybe you're thinking of other options as well and just making sure that you understand all of your options. Either way, hopefully this session today can help you um, better understand what the options are with regards to work that involves animals and we have um, strategically named the event exploring careers impacting animals as i was telling the panelists um, because some careers do impact animals but maybe don't involve working directly hands-on with animals day to day um, so we wanted to make sure that this session incorporated that information as well and i see that my colleague chris is here to help me man the chat thank you chris for being here today so just a quick note about the Experiential Learning Hub um, and what we do. For those of you who haven't visited us before or worked with a career advisor, we offer career advising and job search support, including events and a job board and an events calendar um, for students and alumni. So anything really to do with career planning or job search, we're here to help you with that. Um, we also help support with finding experiential learning opportunities. So if you're a student at the University of Guelph and you're looking for how can I incorporate some experience into my time at the University of Guelph, have something to put on my resume to uh, be more competitive with employers, we can help make recommendations on that. Um, and there's our link at the bottom of the slide just if you are looking to book an appointment to discuss any of these things. So before we go forward with introducing our amazing panelists, I just wanted to begin with a territorial acknowledgement. It is with great respect that the Experiential Learning Hub acknowledges that the University of Guelph resides on the ancestral lands of the Attawandron people and the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We uphold the significance of the Dish with One Spoon Covenant and the continuing relationship our Indigenous neighbours have with this land. We recognize that today this gathering place is home to many First Nation, Métis and Inuit peoples and acknowledging them reminds us of our relationships to this land where we learn and work. OK, so I've explained who I am and I have explained what the event is all about and I hope that that makes sense to everybody um, and we have four great panelists with us today. Thank you again for being here to each of you. So with us today um, to help us better understand possibilities that exist with regards to careers impacting animals and all the amazing work that they do. We have Madeline Kozak, Program and po Policy Analyst, Egg Farmers of Canada. We have Lindsay Case, Director of Sales and Supply Chain Canada for Genus PIC. We have Stephanie McEwen, founder of Soper Creek Wildlife Rescue, and we have Catherine Wright, protection biologist from the Canadian Wildlife Service with Environment and Climate Change Canada. So thank you again for being here today and sharing your wealth of knowledge and your career stories with us. And without further ado, um, I'm just going to ask that each panelist briefly introduces themselves. So what I'm looking for is if you can just briefly describe your current role and the organization that you work for, your educational background, as well as any licenses or certifications maybe that you had to um, receive along the way to get to your current career path. Um, and one thing that kind of surprises people about your career that most people don't know about your career, if you don't mind sharing. I'm going to start with Madison, since your name is here on the far left. Go ahead, Madison. Perfect. Thank okay. you very much. So as mentioned, I'm Madison Kozak. I am a program and policy analyst with the Egg Farmers of Canada. Uh, so what that means is that I manage the Egg Farmers of Canada's research grant program. Additionally, I support the Egg Farmers of Canada 
Canada's animal care program. So we have an animal care program that is implemented on farm that farmers are required to follow. And so I help support and develop that in addition to a number of other files such as working on antimicrobial use, sustainability and animal health. I did my Bachelor of Science in Animal Biology at the University of Guelph, and then I also did my Master of Science by Thesis also at the University of Guelph, which focused on animal welfare and behavior. Um, certifications, one of the certifications I received after graduating was a Professional Animal Auditor Certification, so it's also known as PACO. Uh, it's really handy and you can learn a lot of, from this course and it can go a long way. Um, and something surprising about my position, I think, is just that it exists. A lot of people don't know that there is someone specifically around to create animal welfare programs for animals. A lot of people think that it's, it's up to the farmers to ensure that their animals are being cared to a certain standard, but uh, that's not the case. And additionally, a lot of people don't know that there is research done um, funded by industry to improve the industry all the time. And that's my introduction. <laughs> Thank you, Madison. Great to have you here again. Really appreciate it. And Lindsay, if you don't mind going next, please. Absolutely. So my name is Lindsay Case and I work for a company called Genus PIC and we're a global leader in genetic improvement of livestock. So we do beef, dairy and swine genetic improvement. And that involves quantitative techniques. So things like on-farm data capture and genotyping. And as science evolves and our ability to select for a more sustainable agriculture is also evolving into things like gene editing as the industry progresses to utilize new technologies. So our company works on both the R&D side of genetic improvement, but we're also involved in the complete supply chain of delivering breeding stock. So we would have our own uh, farms where we'd have uh, internal employees working with animals every day. We're also involved in the animal health aspects of our supply chain. And we also provide on-farm technical support to our customers across the industry. So that would be everything from best practices to raise animals as sustainably as possible, as well as things like on-farm biosecurity practices. So we do have a vet team. And we'd also have a team, for example, of nutritionists. So really focusing on everything from kind of the R&D and the new science of genetic improvement to making sure that the animals are performing well on our customers' farms all around the world. So I've held multiple roles at uh, PIC throughout my career. I've been there for 11 years. So I did my PhD at the University of Guelph in animal breeding and genetics. I did my bachelor's and my PhD at the University of Guelph. And as soon as I finished my PhD in animal breeding and genetics, I actually moved to Nashville to work at the headquarters for Genus PIC in North America and spent the last 10 years actually working on the R&D team. So most recently, uh, I, was re I was leading our genetics department for North and South America. Uh, I was fortunate to have the opportunity and was sponsored by Genus to go back and do my MBA at the University of Michigan and finish that up last June. And actually I'm based in Montreal now, so I had the opportunity to move back to Canada and I'm responsible for our entire Canadian business at, at Genus PIC. In terms of certifications, um, we do have a pretty large workforce that's either working with our own animals or our customers' animals on a routine basis. So we'd actually have certifications that we do annually through our company to make sure that we're up to date and certified on anything related to animal health, uh, biosecurity, animal, animal care and handling practices as part of our annual trainings just to make sure that uh, our workforce is safe as we're interacting with our own animals and uh, visiting customer farms. And I think one of the things that surprises people about my career so far is just the number of different opportunities that exist in the animal-based protein supply chain. So from being able to work early on my career on things like 
genotyping plat platforms, data collection, um, gene editing and imaging technologies to then now having the opportunity to more work directly with customers and veterinarians and nutritionists and just the full range of different career opportunities that exist to both directly work with and impact animals, I think is uh, interesting that I didn't fully appreciate when I was a student in my undergrad at the time. Thank you so much for that really great introduction. Very detailed. I really appreciate that. Um, just before we move forward, we had a question for Madison. What certification was it that you received again? I believe that I found it while um, after the student had asked animalauditor.org. I put it in the chat PAACO certification. I just wanted to make sure if I had the right link there and I was sharing the right information for students. Yeah, so it's PAACO. Uh, Paco, um, I'll have to double check the link, but yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, and uh, Stephanie, if you don't mind giving us an introduction into your uh, current career and background, please. Do we have Stephanie here? Stephanie, if you're talking, I cannot hear you. You might be muted. I can't see you, but I thought I spotlighted you. Let me just go check here. Carolina, I think she may have had a technical error. I saw her leave for just a moment. Thanks, Chris. Oh, she's coming back right now. Catherine, let's go on to Catherine introducing herself first and we'll move on to Stephanie next, please, if you don't mind, Catherine. Sure thing. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Catherine and I currently, well, I live in Toronto, but I'm working for the Quebec region of Canadian Wildlife Service, which is part of Environment and Climate Change Canada. And I'm a protection biologist for species at risk. So to describe what I do, basically species at risk are protected federally under the Species at Risk Act, and they're determined if they're at risk, they're listed, a recovery strategy is put in place to help them in their survival and their recovery, and then there are implementations, various protection tools that we can do to help them. So that protection element is where I come in, and we protect species at risk and their critical habitat through various means such as ministerial orders. So this is the job that I've been doing and I'm still new to it. I've only been in this job for about eight months, but I have uh, quite a bit, quite a background with other organizations, some more hands-on, some more hands-off with animals, wildlife, environmental conservation in general, um, some others, Parks Canada, Fisheries and Oceans, Toronto Zoo, Toronto Wildlife Center, um, Secret Animal Hospital, just to, to name a few. Um, so yeah, that is definitely a lot of different organizations focused on animals. In terms of my education, being passionate about animals, I of course chose Guelph to go to for my undergrad, and I did my, my, uh, my Bachelor of Science Honors in Marine and Freshwater Biology with a minor in Psychology. And I pursued a thesis-based master's at Trent University studying dolphins. And I'd say the thing that surprises people when I talk about my career is just kind of similar things. So just the number of organizations that I've been involved with and how they all work with animals. Um, and sometimes I'll talk to people and I'll talk about the different species that I'm working with. And those are usually the things people remember. They remember I worked with pandas or ferrets or dolphins, um, but they don't really remember what I exactly did or how that organization helped those animals. So I think that's that's the one thing I'd say for me. And thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, and I would have to agree, there are so many organizations I've also learned that impact animals and that work with or for animals. Um, I've actually recently developed a list to help students out when I meet with them. Um, just a list of organizations that have something to do with animals to help them get started in their search on what's out there and what's possible. Um, and I'll do my best to share that perhaps when I share the recording after. Um, if anyone would like that, reach out to me or I'm happy to share that list with individuals as well. 
And I see that we have Stephanie back. Hopefully there's no technical issues and those are solved. Stephanie, if you don't mind a brief introduction about yourself, um, educational pathway and one thing that surprises people about your occupation, please. Yes, of course. Well, thank you for having me. Um, that's part of the problems of living and working in the middle of the forest. Our internet decides to kind of pop in and out whenever it feels like it. So we're going to kind of go through this as quickly as I can and hopefully have no more technical difficulties. Um, as mentioned, my name is Stephanie McEwen and I am the founder of Soper Creek Wildlife Rescue. And we're actually Durham Region's only wildlife rehabilitation center and licensed outdoor facility. So we we kind of have the best of both worlds here in terms of taking in sick, injured and orphaned animals and releasing them back out into the wild. Last year, we did about 2,000 animals, which was kind of neat. And I was able to oversee about 250 volunteers and about 45 seasonal staff. The other flip side to it is that we also run um, an educational facility where I am a licensed forest practitioner. And um, all of our programming actually teaches youth about the different conservation aspects, um, the environment, learning, backyard conservation because I really believe that both of these concepts really need to be married together. You can't have one without the other. Obviously, the goal of a wildlife rehabilitation center is to decrease the number of animals that are coming in. Well, how do you do that? By providing educational opportunities. In addition to being the founder of Soper Creek, I'm also the founder of Heroes for Wildlife, which is a not-for-profit organization which helps wildlife rehabilitation centers and wildlife organizations in general with supporting them in terms of purchasing medical equipment, uh, much needed supplies, providing grants, as well as we host an international conference every year, which allows different facilities from around the world to be co to come together and really tackle the challenges that we see, not just in our own backyard, but how can we make a difference in other places across the world. I was lucky enough to graduate from Guelph in 2006 with my major in zoology, but from there um, I've kind of been dabbling in a little bit of everything. I've now currently in the process of fin finishing my final semester as a licensed veterinary technician, just because it really helps with the wildlife aspect or the wildlife center aspect. I have um, certificates in equestrian work and in, as I mentioned, the being a licensed forest practitioner. But I think one of the most memorable things that I've been able to do is I'm one of 30 um, certified rehabbers in all of Ontario and one, uh, sorry, one of four in Ontario and one of 30 across Canada. And that's through the International Wildlife Rehabilitation Council, where you go through a series of testing in order to become an actual certified rehabber. So that's kind of neat. Um, what else? I mean, I think really the thing that surprises me um, and surprises a lot of people about in the field that I'm working with, because it is so vast, is that there's no such thing as weekends or um, holidays, the amount of time and effort that's actually put into it, because I do a lot of work with um, educating the public and which working with animals, there really isn't um, a set day or a time. We just kind of work when the, the, the need is there. So I think that's the one thing that surprises everybody is the amount of actual work that goes into it. Thank you very much. That does sound very, very busy, but very fulfilling also, I would say. We have a question actually, uh, Stephanie, for you. What did the testing entail, Emily is asking, for the Wildlife Rehabilitation Certification? Can you speak a little bit more about that? Yeah, of course, of course. So uh, there's International Wildlife Rehabilitation Council, which has a number of standard tests, which you have to do. It covers everything from your basic geography to biology to physiology. Um, I was lucky that I had already graduated from Guelph, so I had remembered a lot of concepts. But if you go to their website, there's actually study manuals in order for you to become certified. They also require that you are working as part of or volunteering as part of a wildlife rehabilitation center. Um, so you need to have both the hands-on experience as well as the written. The test itself, oh my goodness, um, I believe it took me about an hour and a half or two hours to complete. You needed to be able to obtain a 90% average in order to get your certification.
Thank you. Perhaps when somebody else is speaking later, if you wouldn't mind um, providing some of the links for the certifications, we have some students interested in seeing, finding out more about that. Um, of course. And there's a question, how did you become, I'm wondering this too, how did you become a licensed forest practitioner? There's actually um, only one certification in Ontario as it exists. It's out in Ottawa. It's the Child and Nature um, Alliance who puts on forest practitioner courses uh, sporadically where you travel anywhere across Ontario and you actually learn the theories behind forest school itself. That is, um, you know, they have four very different techniques, including risky play, includes um, back to the forest roots or grass roots, um, and it's inquiry-based learning. So they teach a lot of different concepts than what they teach at Teachers College because it is a very um, different program in terms of there's no clear cut path for your math. You're not going to go into class today and we're going to teach, you know, lesson A on math. It's okay, we're going to throw out a general concept and let's follow where the students lead. So that program itself was really neat. I can also send a link out if anyone is interested in that. I've actually, all of my staff are now certified for that practitioner's course as well, because it is so important to what we believe, not only for those that are teaching the forest programs, but just for the daily connectivity with the public when we're educating everyone. Thank you. Yeah, that's really appreciated. We seem to have a lot of interest and I just want to take a moment um, before we continue on to remind everybody that's here today listening, please feel free to type in any questions or raise your hand if you wanted to speak with any questions for any of the panelists. I have a few prepared, but I want to make sure we cover um, the questions that are being asked in the chat as much as possible. Um, so just one more question uh, for Stephanie before we kind of move on to maybe some other questions. Um, what is the hardest thing about the wildlife rehabilitation certification and how does it make you different than someone without that certification? How does that help you stand out? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So there's different aspects to wildlife rehabilitation. There's provincial licensing, um, which you have to go through not only your mandated tested for um, you know, small mammals and rabies vector species. You have to have an on-site inspection first, which where they um, they come through, they check all of your enclosures, make everything that has been built are up to standards before they actually give you your license. There's other um, federal licensing and as well, and then there's the international licensing. And I think the fact that um, there are only four of us in Ontario that have provincial licensing or sorry, um, international licensing just shows the amount of dedication and the extra knowledge that we do hold. Um, if it was easy, then everyone would be able to do it. And it, it's really not. It's a long process. You need to have references. You need to have experience within the field. And it's combining everything that you learn in university and that you don't learn in university all in one. And I think when the public see um, that extra mile that we've taken to make sure that we are cert or that I am certified to be able to deal with wildlife, life rehabilitation um, animals to that extent, it gives them more of a peace of mind because wildlife rehabilitation itself really, yes, there's licensing, but the governing behind it is, um, it's not really there in terms of being part of it. We're, we're kind of always kind of pushed to the side and seen as, you know, we are people that are just bunny huggers. We want to save absolutely everything. And there isn't really um, an accreditation process like there would be for a zoo where it's a governing body that oversees it. They have to be held accountable for. Yes, we are from the Ministry of Natural Resources, but it's just a little bit different um, in that respect. So I think by having that international certification, it really stands out to the public to be able to say, hey, they went a little bit further and they've learned a little bit more. Great, thank you. Really appreciate that. And you said there's only four people in Canada, is that right, that have that certification? The international? There's four people in Ontario and 30. Of the others, four in Ontario and 30 in Canada. Okay, I see. Thank you very much. So I, I see that there's some other questions coming. I'm just wondering if we could um, 
just back up just for a minute. I think that a big part of learning about careers as a career advisor is just better understanding what a typical day might be like for some of the students considering some of these career paths. So I'm wondering if we could just take a minute for each of you to explain what is a typical day like in your role if someone was to get into a role similar to yours. What would that look like in a typical day or is there a typical day? And I'm just going to make it easy again and start with Madison, please. Um, yeah, so I would say that I, I don't generally have a typical day. My work is more so project based. So I generally work on projects that can last years at a time, such as the animal care program that takes up lots of years to develop and get approved. So a lot of the time it can be um, brainstorming with colleagues, interacting with researchers, writing and developing programs and memos, policies regarding animal health, welfare and research, um, interacting with stakeholders. A big part of my role, as I mentioned before, is managing the egg farmers of Canada's research program. So what this means is that we are a funding uh, partner. So we provide grants to researchers to perform research at universities to improve the egg industry, whether that's improving animal welfare and finding ways to um, improve the environmental footprint that egg farms have, improve nutrition, improve performance, etc. There's also lots of research that our researchers do to focus on um, human health as well. So how are there ways that we can use eggs to improve the, uh, there was one study that was recently done on the retina. And then there's also research that we fund that focuses on alternative uses of eggs. So using a waste product from eggs, such as the eggshell to um, find new ways to use it, such as for bone scaffolding. So uh, what I do in terms of that part of my job is I run the call for proposals. I bring all the research proposals that we've received to our research committee and I help the research committee decide what projects to fund. Additionally, I assist with and run the peer review process. And then I assist with knowledge transfer. So we want to make sure we get the research that we have done out to our farmers and to stakeholders because if no one knows about the research, it's not going to help anybody. Uh, additionally, I work with industry stakeholders um, and attend stakeholder meetings, as mentioned before. Um, but yeah, so a lot of my, it's not generally very similar day to day. It can be and it can't be, but it's very project based. So it's, it's things that are, that are ongoing all the time. Great, thank you. And we we actually have a question for you, so I'll just jump in and ask that while it's still here, fresh on my screen. How do you develop the animal welfare program? Do you use previous guidelines and legislation or legislation from Canada or around the world? What do you use to get that going? So there's an organization called NFAC, N-F-A-C-C. Um, that's another thing is the number of acronyms in, in the industry is outrageous. So if you have, <laughs> everyone's nodding their head, yeah. So whenever you start a job, make sure you keep a long list of acronyms, especially when you first start. Um, so NFAC develops codes of practice, and this is developed based on people in the industry uh, and stakeholders. So there's lots of different people sitting at the table when the codes of practice are developed. So there's researchers, there's animal welfare um, experts, there's farmers, all sorts of people, they come together and they develop a set of standards that are required. And this can be used in terms of law in Canadian law. But so what we have done is we, and what more, most organizations do is they take the code of practice and you take all the requirements and you create an audit. So we used all of NFAC's requirements for laying hens and pullets and made our animal care program based on that and we just needed to essentially determine and define how th certain things would be audited how certain things would look etc so that's how our animal care program was developed great thank you and i hope i got the right link here in the chat for anybody that might be interested in exploring that further 
Uh, we're going to go on to Lindsay. If you could describe a typical day in your role, and if anyone uh, along the way has questions for Lindsay, please feel free to type those in the chat. Yeah, absolutely. So I'd say in a role in a animal breeding and genetics company, if you think about a pie chart with how you spend your time, there's three primary categories or types of buckets of activities we would do. Uh, one would be working with pigs, one would be working with people, and one would be working with data. So depending on kind of the role or any given day, it's divided into those three kind of basic types of activities. When it comes to working with pigs, uh, one of the neat opportunities that we have is to visit farms all over Canada and all over the world, essentially learning best practices as we go. So we get the opportunity to travel quite a bit, see different farms, learn what's working well and maybe what's not, and then apply that to our next customer visit or industry visit, always leveraging what we learn and what we get to see across a lot of different production systems to improve our toolkit of knowledge about what will work best for the next customer that we visit. So great opportunities to become a subject matter expert in swine production that lets you be a more valuable asset to a customer, the next person that you visit. In terms of working with people, we spend a lot of time working directly with customers, especially in my role today, uh, sharing the value of um, how to best work with our pigs, why our genetics will bring them uh, the most sustainable, most profitable, most tasty pork within the industry. And that can be anyone from, again, someone who's working on a farm, best management practices, all the way to going to the head offices in Mississauga with Maple Leaf Foods talking about how uh, our genetic package can help them towards their zero net emissions goals. So interacting with people, uh, there's a wide range of stakeholders that we have the opportunity to interact with, which keeps things uh, always interesting. So I really enjoy that piece of it. And then working with data, uh, we are, are an R&D company at our core. So uh, whether you're directly involved in product development and on-farm data capture or laboratory work, like I was in one of my previous roles, or today the opportunity to say, hey, we're doing some really neat research. I'd just like to go visit for a day or a week and see what's going on in that department. Uh, there's always the opportunity to continue to work in or at least experience what we're doing in terms of our cutting edge R&D and data side. So depending on your interests, your long term career aspirations, what you like doing, where you want to continue to develop, uh, you get the opportunity to blend the mix of working with people with uh, pigs and working with uh, data. Thank you. It sounds like you really have a mix of everything going on within your role. Very, I'm sure it doesn't get boring very often, it sounds like. <laughs> we do have a question for you, Lindsay. What was your first job after graduation? And what do you think made you stand out as an applicant? Was it your PhD topic, perhaps? That's a great question. And I noticed one of the other questions you had there, Miriam, about uh, what you focused on with your master's or your PhD and how that directly led to uh, your next, your first career opportunity. Um, my PhD was actually in turkeys, so genetic improvement, but in turkeys. And I would say that the value, and I do a lot of recruiting for our company uh, today, young people coming out of an undergrad, a master's or a PhD, I would say one of the primary skills we'd be looking for in someone with a master's or PhD is just the ability to problem solve. So, for example, I did my uh, PhD in turkeys, but I was able to say I'm very passionate about pigs. I learned how to proactively solve problems, and I'll be able to carry that into any role within the company, uh, whether I'm working with pigs or whether I'm working with poultry or whatever that different one is. So I think um, one of the skills that's great for young people to arm themselves with, whether they're doing a master's, a PhD, or coming out of undergrad, is really developing that at that ability or that interest or that passion into being a proactive problem solver and being able to take uh, advantage of different resources around you creatively, whether that's data, whether that's your peers in the industry or within the company, and using that to find new ways to make whatever your role is uh, more successful, whether that's helping a customer succeed or when your peers succeed or to come up with a new uh, idea for research and development. So, um, I'd say that uh, 
if, for example, in our company, we're not just looking for someone with a master's or a PhD for the purpose of having that degree. There's other ways to show us your uh, ability to solve problems and be proactive and wanting to, to contribute to driving things forward. Uh, for myself, I did uh, my PhD was in genetics and I did start initially in a genetics role. But again, by leveraging that to um, more focus on collaboration, problem solving, I've been able to switch my career quite a bit, really away from the R&D side of our company, more business development. Wonderful. Thank you, Lindsay. We have another question for you, actually. Um, what is the current research regarding genes and the supply chain most focused on? And what's the biggest outcome you're looking to fulfill at the moment, such as increased sustainability, yield, taste, et cetera? Absolutely. Yes. It would be a combination. That was a very smart kind of list of different things that we'd be focusing on in terms of genetic improvement for our uh, supply chain. So if you look at the impact of genetic progress alone on uh, the animal protein supply chain, specifically pork, Compared to 20 years ago, and I'm sure many of these people on this call are just approaching 20 years old. So in, in your lifetimes alone, we've been able to increase the number of piglets a sow has per year by 28. And for example, we had a customer who had a litter of 36 healthy live born pigs last week. A given sow farm of about 2,500 sows can produce about 17.5 million more pounds of pork per year on 50% less land. So any given sow farm, about 2,500 sows in southern Ontario, for example, that same sow farm is now feeding about 350,000 more Canadians with nutritious pork, and it's requiring less than half the amount of land to be able to do it. So that would be looking at things like, again, the sustainability piece, how can a certain number of animals feed more people and require fewer environmental resources to do that? So at the core, that's what our company would be doing on, focusing on the health of the animals so that they grow quickly, produce a lot of pork and don't need as much land resources in terms of manure or feed to be able to do it. You also brought up a very great point there about the taste of the pork and uh, there are countries in the world where pork consumption is continuing to e increase. That would be places like Mexico and Asia. There's a strong preference for pork in the diet. In Canada, it's almost plateaued. So you can think about the popularity of something like a Baconator, but are more people having ham or a turkey as they look at their traditional meals or how many people are eating ham or pork-based product outside of bacon at weekly at their dinner tables, there is a plateau in consumption in Canada, for example. And to your point, finding ways to incorporate uh, the taste of the meat in our selection program is something we're focused on as well. So for example, we do a lot of beta capture and incorporation into our genetic and program at packing plants, going to the extent of cooking pork chops from animals within our genetic population and measuring the amount of force required to actually cut a sample of pork meat and the less force required to cut a cooked pork chop, the more tender it is and the better the eating experience is for consumers. So we're really looking at the full farm to table value chain from reducing the environmental impact to create pork and then making pork that's really tasty. So even in markets where consumption's plateaued, we'll hopefully be able to increase consumer demand going forward. Great, thank you so much, Lindsay. Very great questions coming in so far and really thoughtful, thorough answers. Really appreciate that. Please keep the questions coming if you have any questions. I'm gonna uh, now switch over to Stephanie just to tell us a little bit more about your role in a typical day in your role, if you don't mind. And anyone who has questions for Stephanie, please type them in the chat. So a typical day for me, I wish that there was one, but we really don't. Um, as the founder of the organization itself, I am a Jane of all trades. So anything from um, doing our social media posts and running all 
all of those campaigns I take care of. There is all of, you know, payroll and accounting that I have to do as well. Um, putting into place all of our policies and procedures, ensuring that all of the construction and design of all of our enclosures meet all the standards. I also orchestrate everything with our veterinary, so a veterinarian in terms of medication, um, the, the plan for every indiv individual animal that's coming out. I also make sure that there's a plan in place for all of our cooperative education students and any internships that we have. We actually just started up a new internship for the those that are looking to get into veterinary medicine. So I have to make sure that we're in compliance with all of those regulations as well. And I do a lot of working with different universities and colleges in terms of putting those programming into place. Um, my goodness. Obviously, there's the animal aspect. So when the animals are coming in, I make sure that we're doing the physical exams for them or that the uh, one other individual that I have is trained to make sure that she's doing the physical examinations properly. And then we can coordinate an overall plan for those individual animals. And I also make sure that my director of education is um, doing all of the programming and it really meets the missions and visions of Soper Creek. So everything that we do, whether it is uh, from a forest day program during the week or to maybe be an activity for families on weekends. We really want to make sure that all of our missions and visions of teaching conservation um, and about the environment and connecting those two are always being met in the activities that we do. So they're really a typical day. It's um, whatever the day will throw at us. Thank you, Stephanie. We have a question that came in from Jalen. How do you bring in money to run your rescue is the question. Oh yes, because wildlife rehabilitation is a free service that we offered. Um, we don't get paid for any of this work. A lot of time is spent finding grants that we qualify for, talking um, to the general public and relying on public donations. So really making a good statement on social media has a really positive impact on the donations that we receive through storytelling, our uh, monthly newsletters, being able to have those connections with the people helps a lot with uh, our ability to fundraise because that's the only source of revenue that we have other than those educational programming, which also makes sense as to why it's important for my staff to be certified forest practitioner so we can ensure that all the programming that we're teaching has a general oversight and is very consistent. And I think balancing that fundraising ability, uh, whether it's through GoFundMe, you know, those sort of things, as well as our educational programming really ensures that the, the success of the Wildlife Rehabilitation Center is there. Thank you. Um, we have another question coming in. It seems like your days are really busy, Alyssa is saying, and not really getting much time off. As you already said, you're a Jane of all <laughs> trades. You do it all, all the time. Um, not sure when you sleep. Do you find that yourself and or others in the field struggle with burnout is the question. That is a fantastic question. Um, I've actually made sure that myself and all of my staff, we have monthly wellness check-ins where we sit down and we have meetings about um, the, the stress involved with the job because a lot of people or the general public assume that animals that are coming in, it's like going to the vets. You're just getting your vaccines and then they're healthy and they, they go back home. But that's not the case. These animals are really sick and they're coming into it with a negative deficit. So we do have our monthly wellness checks within the staff themselves where we also do on online presentations. We have um, a counselor actually from the States who does a lot of work with veterinary technicians. She comes in and she meets with us via Zoom to be able to tackle those subjects. Um, and really remembering to schedule time to stop. And that is probably the most important thing. I have to remind myself and my staff it's okay to go home at nine o'clock and sh shut off your phone. It's okay to schedule your weekends and your days off. And it's really important that I make sure that I'm dealing with my staff or my volunteers that it's their day off and we're not going to reach out to them because it's really, really easy to get caught up in the moment and say, yes, yes, yes. And that's how I was for the first five years when we started Soper Creek was that how do you say no to an animal that needs you or how do you say no to the extra overnight care and you get tired really fast and if you get tired then you're going to start making mistakes so yes um 
there are those times where you're tired and exhausted, but if you align yourself with great network, like we have a great relationship with lots of other wildlife centers, you may be to capacity or you may be overwhelmed, you may need a break. You have those um, connections where you can rely to. And, and that was a big part of why we started Heroes for Wildlife, where we're able to build those bridges, not only between those wildlife centers in Ontario and in Canada, but around the world to be able to realize that you're not the only one and to provide you platforms for um, being able to vent, taking a deep breath and realizing you're not the only one because burnout, as everyone here knows, I'm sure, dealing with animals and burnout is a, a reality of the job and you just have to have those systems in place. And even if it's just a dinner with the girls, we're all girls here. So you, you know how you have dinner with the girls and you talk about some really bad things, you talk about really good things and you just have that time to yourself. So that's a great question because it's something that you see all the time in the industry. Thank you. That's great. Really, really important question. And, you know, it'd be great to hear other people on the panel's perspectives on this at some point during today, too, and, and how you manage to avoid or do your best to avoid burnout as well. That would be an interesting thing to come back to. Um, Stephanie, we also have a question here, and I think this one for you could is optional in my opinion. The question is, do you receive a salary? Did you want to comment on kind of how your pay structure is made up? Of course, yeah. Um, for the first five years, I did not receive any salary. My husband has a real job that was lucky enough to be able to support the Wildlife Center itself. Um, and then it wasn't just until the last six months that I was able to start receiving a very minimum wage salary for the amount of work that we do. Um, because that was also something that was really important when I took a business course was for entrepreneurs making sure that you are valuing the work that you do as well. Obviously, in the work of rehabilitation, it's not something that's always done. There was five years where we couldn't because all of the money needed to go back into establishing the incubators, the medical costs, all of that. Um, but once we were in a place that it made sense, then yes, as of you know, six months ago, I was able to start bringing a salary. But trust me, it is nothing that is glamorous by any means. <laughs> Thank you for answering that. And I also noticed, I hope this is a sign that things are <clears throat> kind of um, going well go for you in that respect, because I, as I said to you in one of my emails or messages, I think I noticed that there was a summer job opportunities with the rescue uh, coming up. So that sounded like a great experience opportunity for even some of the students that might be here today. Um, so I just thought I would comment on that. And, and that's great that you're able to get some additional support, hopefully this summer. Yeah, the summer job grant program is fantastic. Typically, we hire anywhere between 30 and 40 students between both Soper Creek Wildlife as well as Heroes for Wildlife. Um, and that's an opportunity for all local businesses in Ontario. Awesome. And we have one more question here for you, Stephanie. What was your first job after graduation and what made you stand out as an applicant? Yeah, so so my first job was actually um, working in African Lion Safari, where I was a game attendant. Um, I was doing live um, ultrasounds with the rhinos and the giraffes, doing the feeding, doing deworming, all of that. I was really lucky. I knew that I wanted to work directly with animals since I was probably five years old and I had rescued a seagull. Um, so I had based my entire career from 14 years old volunteering at a vet clinic working with cats. And then I did my co-op placement there. Um, from there, I decided at 16, I wanted to work at African Lion Safari. And they told me I was too young to work with the animals. But if I worked in the gift shop for one year, year they would let me go early to work with the animals so I did my duty I did the gift shop for a year they pushed me over into the the actual game reserve itself and while I was there I wanted to make sure that I was still getting extra experience so I volunteered working in the elephant department and we ran an international um, ultrasound conference for elephants so I volunteered for that I also did rounds with our veterinarian not just for a while uh, for for African Lion Safari, but he did rounds with large animals because my goal ultimately was to become a vet. That's what I wanted to do until I realized it didn't have the relationship with animals that I was looking for personally. So I kind of veered away from that. I still gained all this extra experience. I worked at African Lion Safari for 
nine years, I believe. Then I worked at a racetrack uh, with horses. And then I actually worked at another zoo in Bowmanville for 10 years. And then it wasn't until my daughter was actually on, I was on maternity leave with her, that we decided to take a leap of faith and start a wildlife rehabilitation center because my son, who was three at the time, loved squirrels. And I had always believed that I was an animal advocate, that I you know, knew everything about pandas and gorillas and rhinos and giraffes, but I knew nothing about what was going on in Ontario or in Canada for these animals. They were always overlooked. So we took a leap of faith, we sold our house and we started up Soper Creek. So I was lucky enough to already have so much experience in working with so many different veterinarians and, and different uh, facilities before I was able to start Soper Creek. It's great, thank you. It sounds like you took a lot of really calculated risks to get to where you are. And it sounds like they were really worthwhile, right? And you're on a journey that's very fulfilling and. I think that's something that is important to recognize when it comes to entrepreneurship, that sometimes it's it's a big risk, but it can definitely really pay off and be very satisfying, right? I'm, I'm really happy that you're sharing that perspective. I just shared the summer job posting in the chat if anyone is interested. We had a few questions about that after I had mentioned it. So um, yeah, thank you for asking. There's also a question that I'm curious about, and I'm assuming we're talking about um, accommodations with regards to perhaps disability or mental health or family, but there's a question about, do you offer any on-site accommodations for any of your staff? Ainsley, if I'm not correct on my interpretation of that, please do clarify. So we don't actually have any on-site accommodations for people to live on property. Um, it's just our facility is so packed as it is, and we're situated in the middle of a forest, so we don't have a lot of space for outbuildings. Um, all of our outbuildings are the hospital itself. So we have an ICU building, we have an, a mammal building, we have an avian building, but other than that, it's pretty thick forest, uh, which is great for rehabilitating animals, but it's not so good for space itself. We're also on a protected forest too, so we can't put in permanent structures in certain areas. So itself, we don't have that ability. We do actually have partnerships with lots of different hotels and um, Airbnbs that are local to us, where if we do have people that are coming for the summer from either overseas or from, you know, from Guelph, because we're still about two and a half hours away, that there is um, a reduced rate that those students are then able to, to get a spot at one of the hotels or the Airbnbs because we're inconvenient. We're in the middle of nowhere, even from our own, like from Bowmanville itself, we're still from downtown Bowmanville, a good 20 minutes drive up north, so. Thank you, and my apologies. I right before this had an accessibility meeting, and that's where my head was at. But I understand this was referring to housing, so <laughs> my apologies for that one. So I I think that that thank you very much for all of the really great answers there, Stephanie. I just want to make sure we have a, an opportunity to speak with Catherine a little bit. So I'm going to move on and ask Catherine to tell us more about a typical day in her role. And please feel free to ask any questions for Catherine. Um, and then perhaps when we're done. Um, when Catherine's kind of done answering some of the questions and talking about herself, um, just make sure all of you that are here today, please, if there's any other questions for any of the panelists, please feel free to write them um, to make sure that we don't miss anybody's burning questions today. So Catherine, can you tell us a little bit more about a typical day? If there is a typical day, it sounds like so far we don't have a typical day of most of these roles, but let's hear what you have to say. Yeah, I think the last job I had where I had typical days was years ago when I was a zookeeper at Toronto Zoo and ever since then it's been just depending on the project and sometimes the time of year what's going on um so I'll just give you some examples of things that I'm doing this week or different files that I'm working on um so even, even daily I'm switching between different files different subjects different species um, and I'm often doing my own tasks, but I'm often helping colleagues or working with colleagues. Um, a lot of our tasks, um, because it depends on the species, if it's a species that's only found in Quebec, we're working very regional. But if it's a species that fa is found across Canada, we're working with national colleagues. Um, we, each region does its own part for whatever the protection measure is, and then we coordinate with our headquarters in Ottawa who kind of runs the process and like all the coordination and you know puts ministerial order A in place. So there's lots of different 
people that are involved in a lot of my work as well. Um, so, for example, with the protection measures, so there are a couple of tools. So, for example, under Section 58 of the Species at Risk Act, so once um, a species at risk is listed, it has its recovery strategy in place, it's published, you know, X many days later, we have to put a 58 in place to protect their habitat on federal lands. So we have one that just kick-started last week. So I was coordinating with our GIS technician who looks, where is this species found in Quebec? So we know where we're gonna put the order in. Again, working with national headquarters. Eventually we do consultation with First Nations, with the province. Um, and we work together to put that order in place. And these things take time as well. So this order is just in the process, but we have one for different species that we're kind of finishing up at the same time. We have a report that we have to do twice a year um, and our next one is just starting. So this week I have to reach out to the province to get some input from them. And then I have to review what have we done federally to protect species at risk and report on that. So that's getting going. Uh, Western chorus frog is one of my hot files. Um, we put an, an emergency order in place in a city outside Montreal last fall. So we are dealing with post order ongoing since then. So every week we have a weekly meeting with everyone in my region who's involved. And we do all our updates. What's the status going on? What are we doing with the city and the province in the meantime to continue to protect the frog? Um, we also have caribou that is a hot file. And so one of my colleagues is leading that. And so I'm working very closely with her because we have a meeting with a First Nation community this week. So we're getting prepared for that. Uh, we often have to brief our senior management, um, sometimes even up to minister level of things that are going on. So I have a briefing to prepare, um, updating my supervisor. Um, yeah, there's just always a lot of different stuff going on, but I really like that variety um, that I get. So yeah, <laughs> not a typical day. Thank you very much. We have a question for you here. What has been your proudest moment so far as a protector of animals? Um, I mean, in not necessarily just this job, but in, in general in my career, like I've just always wanted to really help animals, um, whether it's protection, conservation, you know, whatever words you want to use. That's just, I've always just wanted to make a difference for the lives of the animals and by consequence, you know, the environment. And so that's just you not know, like with the frog, like it's a concrete measure. We were putting this order in place to help the frog. Um, back when I was breeding and reintroducing ferrets and marmots into the wild, it's like, you know, I'm having like a direct impact on these animals in the wild. Things that humans have done, these animals are now at risk. It's like, I feel like I'm helping to, you know, make up for some of that. So that's, that's what I've always been focused on. That's wonderful. That must be so exciting, those times. Definitely, that sounds so great. We have a few other questions coming in, so I, I want to get to those. Um, this is a, a one I'm wondering about also. Do you do any in-lab research as part of your role, or is the position mostly stakeholder collaboration and, and report writing and a meeting kind of based as well? Uh, this job has been more of a desk job than other ones that I've had in the past. Um, I've had ones that are more lab based, so I was working for fisheries and oceans studying freshwater mussels. Um, and it was more of a science job. We like like science in the sense of, you know, research, like you go out into the rivers, you look for mussels, you gather your abundance and distribution data and you write reports and those kind of things. And so that had some in lab work um, because we would collect um, samples and then you're looking through microscopes to look for the little tiny baby mussels and count them and measure them and um, things like that. So it really depends on the job and there's within Canadian Wildlife Service there's so many different jobs. Some you're out in the field um, collecting research at some times in the year and then you're back in the office. Some are generally either like policy based, you're more in the office or 
it really totally varies just depending on the job. Thank you. A few more questions here coming in for you. Um, given the background of your education, do you have a goal of working in wildlife uh, protection for marine animals specifically? Working with dolphins was always a dream job growing up, and um, I, I specifically looked for that when I wanted to do a master's. I wanted to work with someone studying dolphins, and I was able to find that. Um, so I'm glad that I did it for a couple of years and I did an internship with dolphins as well during my undergrad. Um, so even if I never get back to marine mammals, you know, I can check it off my bucket list. Um, but I knew being focused on marine mammals, I didn't, I never wanted to limit myself to that because it's competitive. It, my priorities might change. I knew it would probably mean me moving to the coast, but my family's here in Toronto and maybe I would change my mind and not want to do that. There's so many factors that come up. Right. So I kind of shifted my mindset and just wanted to focus more on like, yeah, would still love to do dolphins and maybe one day I'll get there. But other, you know, that's fine as long as I can still protect wildlife um, and find the happy out of the job that I have. Great. Awesome, thank you. We have a few people interested in your experience at the Toronto Zoo. Uh, what was it like to work there? And some questions about how it may be very competitive to get into the zoo. So what do you feel made you stand out as an applicant with, with that position? Mm -hmm. So at the zoo, so I worked at the zoo on and off over about a 10 year span. And my first job, kind of similar to Stephanie, you know, just got to get my foot in the door. I was a camp counselor my first summer. And then that made it a lot easier for me to transfer into zookeeping the next summer because it being very competitive, they don't always hire externally. Sometimes it's those internal candidates that move forward quicker. Um, so a lot of people will start out in retail, camp counseling, like anything just to get their foot in the door. Um, but I was lucky in my second summer that I was able to move into a, a position and I did have some i done a lot of volunteering as well, some from even on campus at Guelph, the Aqualab, the Full Watch program, the Central Animal Facility. I, I did a lot um, there. So I was always trying to build my resume with anything related to animals that I could. Um, and at the zoo, so in addition to being a zookeeper for many years, and I worked in different areas for anyone who knows the Toronto Zoo, it's kind of divided geographically. So I worked with lots of different species in different sections. Um, but my favorite job um, was the breeding and reintroduction for the ferret and marmot programs. Um, just because, I mean, first of all, like I love animals and behavior and, um, you know, watching babies grow up, of course, everyone loves that. But, you know, it was just, it was that mixture of the husbandry and everything, but you're, these animals are going into the wild. You know, we saw the kits off um, in the fall to go out to, the mountains and to be released and it's just it was such like a rewarding feeling um but i also those i never got like a full-time job with that um i ended up working my first like full-time year-round full-time job was in with the wetland conservation program so that was focused on amphibians and reptiles and their wetland habitats in different ways that we were helping to conserve those um, so yeah, a lot of things, you know, one led to another at the zoo. Um, but I loved, I loved my time at the zoo and felt very lucky to have worked there. Thank you very much. There was just one more question. Is there an internship program with your organization or your department for students? Um, not quite sure. Um, the best way to look for jobs within the government is going onto their website. So. They have, um, I, I can find the link and put it into the chat, but it's it, it's a website where you can click kind of what jobs you're interested in, where are you interested, and you can even get daily alerts. There are a lot of student jobs that come up, especially for the summers. Um, but again, it totally varies depending on the department. Uh, when I was working at Parks Canada, we always had summer students and you were often out in the field doing so many different tasks. Um, I know there are some co-op positions with different departments, but some work more directly with different universities. Um, so I would definitely check out the, the website. That's the first start. 
to find out about jobs. And I know a lot are starting to look now for the summer. Thank you. Yeah, I would have to agree. I think I've seen a few coming up. I can't recall any specifics at this given moment, um, but hopefully maybe one of my colleagues, Chris, or somebody can plop it into the chat for some students if you happen to have the link available for the summer jobs um, with the Government of Canada. We have a question here for Lindsay. Um, is your company working on genetic improvement involving swine welfare, especially the lameness issue? Yeah, there's three areas we're working on in terms of a genetic improvement of animal welfare. Uh, one is actually using a gene editing or CRISPR technology. So anyone um, with a swine background would know PERS is the most devastating disease to commercial swine worldwide. And it would cost uh, the US and Canada alone about $170 million per year in animal losses. And we've actually been able to use CRISPR gene editing to create an animal that's completely resistant to the PERS disease. So that animal can be exposed to the PERS, for example, if neighboring farms um, would have PERS and it is endemic in North America, Canada, most parts of the world, and it fundamentally cannot get sick from that disease. So we're routinely looking at novel technologies that can be used to make game-changing improvements to the welfare of the animals in ways that traditional breeding methods have not been able to in the past. So that's an exciting thing for our company. And we actually have a patent on exclusive rights to use a CRISPR gene editing in pigs and cattle. So we're excited to see the opportunities that that can bring to the industry. For example, there was a heart transplant successfully last month of a pig heart into a human being using similar type of types of uh, CRISPR gene editing. So being able to see that technology that's successfully improving human health and also finding ways to improve animal welfare by using it in swine as well. We're also continuing to look at new technologies that enable us to better understand the characteristics that make a robust animal in ways that we haven't been able to in the past. And if I can here, um, can just show you guys a quick video. So for example, in the past, when we were analyzing confirmation of the animal, we'd have trained selection officers looking for certain characteristics in the animal with their visual eyes. And we're now able to use imaging technology to essentially let um, computer algorithms that we've developed to get a more objective look at characteristics of the animals, looking at aspects like the gait, the structure of the legs in terms of the angles of the ankles and the hawk, different pieces like that. So we're continuing to use new technology to understand in a more objective way what in the past has been left up to the human eye. And similar in terms of understanding behavioral characteristics of animals that will lead to uh, better animal welfare and robustness. So, for example, using imaging technology to better understand the feeding behaviors of animals. Um, when can we tell earlier if an animal is potentially sick by using a lot more, again, objective data that new technology is allowing us to capture? So that is a, a great question and absolutely one of the continued highest priorities that we're continuing to look at as we go forward. Thank you, Lindsay. Maybe you can start answering the next question. We have had a few questions on this topic, so if you can each kind of take a turn, we've addressed this a little bit, but um, is your organization currently offering anything for students, any internship programs? Um, I'd like to hear from each of you on that. If I know we already touched on that a little bit, but love to hear from you, Lindsay. Yeah, we have a summer internship program. It's primarily focused on getting hands-on experience directly with animals. So that could be working in a commercial hog farm, for example, in parts of Southern Ontario, or at one of our elite genetic farms where we're doing data capture, like for example, some of this imaging technology we've just seen. And those are in a bit more remote locations just due to biosecurity and would be uh, primarily based in Saskatchewan. So those summer internships are for people uh, in the middle of their undergrad who would really like hands-on swine experience. 
We also have a career opportunity for graduates from undergrad, master's, PhD. That would be your first job into the company. We call it our career graduate trainee program. And the first entire year is a fully salaried position, fully training and getting experience to the different aspects of our company, which is great. It didn't exist when I entered the, the company, that's for sure. So getting a very, very solid foundation across aspects of the pigs, the data, and the people. It's a great opportunity. And as you graduate after your first year, you have the opportunity to decide which department within the company uh, you're most interested in working in. So we do have both a summer internship opportunity and then an opportunity for people finishing up school interested in working in the uh, in swine genetics industry. Thank you, Lindsay. If you don't mind, if you do have the links, would you mind sharing those in the chat for any of those opportunities, please? Awesome. And um, Madison, uh, is there anything that you could say with regards to that? Are there any opportunities that you could speak to, internships or opportunities for students to get involved? To my knowledge, we don't have any internships. Um, yeah, so I can't off the top of my head think of other ways for students to get involved just when positions open up at the Egg Farmers of Canada. Sure, and I know Catherine and I, we had already chatted a little bit about this and Stephanie, I had already shared a link there for some opportunities. Um, so hopefully that helps to answer the questions. I'm just checking the chat if there's anything, um, any other questions that have popped up. We are coming close to almost the end of the panel, so I wanted to give everybody, all the panelists, a chance to kind of speak a little bit more. I'm wondering, since we have very little time left, um, if we could just go with each of you again with regards to what's kind of one main piece of advice you would give to students who are kind of lost right now with regards to what should I be doing to, to um, align myself with a career that impacts animals? How can I be kind of leveraging my time as a university student? Um, you know, what's the number one piece of advice you might give these young people today? I'll start with Catherine because you're on my far left right now on my screen. I don't know where my slides went, but that's OK. I see you on my far left anyway. Sure. A um, few things that I usually think of is one, I, and I touched on this, but just keeping an open mind because there's so much out there. Um, there's so many different things you can do and different things that you might not even know you liked. Um, you know, one of my jobs was more environmental focus, not wildlife, which I wanted, but I had an amazing team. And like overall, I actually really liked that job compared to another one where I was working with animals, but you know, just the different factors. I actually liked this other job better and I didn't expect that. Um, so you never know. Um, I think volunteering, doing other extracurriculars, or, uh, there's so many things you can do. You can get involved with committees, with different groups, um, and that helps you build some skills that you can add to your resume, help you figure out things that you like, meet people. You never know where those can lead. Um, so that's really great. And um, it was already mentioned transferable skills, but those are our definitely very important. I know when we were hiring at adopt a pond for a wetland technician in the summer, sure, it's great if we can find someone who's tracked turtles, but I could teach you how to track turtles. I can't teach you um, as well like teamwork and being able to just work outside in the rain or the sun and still have a positive attitude. So if you have the things like that that are transferable skills from jobs that may not even be related like you can sell those and, and people look for those so I think those are some of my big pieces of advice thank you and that's a big thing that we do in our work as career advisors is we kind of strive to help teach students how to kind of translate those skills we have a lot of students coming to us kind of saying well I only did this or I only worked at McDonald's or whatever it might be and they're kind of downplaying some of those first jobs but really you do gain a lot of transferable skills and it's all about how you talk about those things on your resume in relation to the next job that you're applying for so for those of you listening today if you haven't met with our, anyone on our team before I really recommend that you do so if you're not sure how to go about doing that but it can really make a difference Lindsay, what piece of advice would you give students that are listening? Uh, this is a pretty simple one, but it speaks to what uh, Catherine and Carolina just said as we're hiring. Um, write a not 
tailor your res, and this is just going to be pretty practical, but tailor your resume and your cover letter to the job that you're looking for and show passion and interest. So we'd be looking at uh, internship or trainee programs and they aren't taking the opportunity to, again, show the transferability of the skills that they have on the resume or taking the opportunity to update the resume and provide a nice color cover letter that shows um, how their past experience will work really well for the next position and uh, passion specifically for the role that they're applying for. So I wouldn't underestimate the importance of spending an extra 10 to 15 minutes to go through your resume and show how it uh, is specifically relevant to the job you're applying for in any application process. I think one of the other things that um, just to continue to show is the world is going to change a lot in your working lives. And I think one of the things that most employers will be looking for is your ability to just continually learn and want to grow and evolve throughout your careers. Um, the jobs that we're doing now are going to look dramatically different 10, 15, 20 years from now. So your ability to be adaptable and to continually grow throughout your career as you're new and entering a company are no matter what, what job or role you're looking for, things that will suit you well and something that employers will be looking for. Thank you so much for that. I just kind of reiterated that adaptability is so key today, especially, you know, in the world that we're living in today. And there's a kind of this mindset slash career assessment tool that we use and we teach in our department called the challenge mindset. And it's all based on this tool called the challenge cards where we're really we're helping students identify kind of what is it that you want to contribute to solve or change in the world? What bothers you? What problems do you want to work on? As opposed to what's that job title you should pick? and pursue forever because those job titles can change, right? Jobs go away, new jobs come. So it's more important to know kind of what what are you trying to accomplish? What are you trying to work toward? So I love that you said that. When you know that, then you can adapt to other um, circumstances. So thank you for saying that. I also just put in the chat for anyone interested in how can I get more involved? How can I develop my experience based on some of these suggestions? A link to our experiential learning catalog where you can search for opportunities um, if you're looking for guidance on how to use that, please do request a career advisor appointment if you need to do that as well. Madison, what piece of advice would you give? So one of the pieces of advice that I'd give, and it's slightly been mentioned before, but you don't have to start in a job or position that you've always seen yourself in. Um, opportunities to move to different positions and companies happen all the time. So most of the time you just need to start somewhere um, it may not look exactly like you thought it would. Your career path likely won't look exactly like you thought it would. Uh, sometimes you have to jump around and do things that you never thought you would, and that's totally okay. Another point that I just wanted to just mention is that try to remember that you don't have to have it all figured out the second you leave university and get your and you're looking for your first job. It's going to take time. It's and that's okay. It's it's okay. It, you're going to be okay. It's sometimes it's overwhelming because up until this point in your life, you just had a clear path of school. And then you just, okay, my next, uh, I go to elementary. Okay, now I go to high school. Now I go to university or college. And then there's this kind of open area where you're not sure what's going to happen. And that's, that can be quite unnerving for a lot of people. But you will figure it out and everything will be okay. And you don't have to have it all figured out the second you're done. I love that. I was just frantically searching for an image that we frequently share with students, but I can't seem to get it to upload. Um, it basically shows a picture that says your path versus reality. And in our heads, we have this this map drawn of our path being straight and linear and biking along a smooth surface. And then reality is showing the person kind of going along, but there's all these peaks and valleys and bumps along the way. So that's, you know, that's true for a lot of people. And the more of these panels that I participate in, the more you know, you hear that over and over again. I think for the career advisors here today, none of this is really news. Um, so I think the sooner people kind of grasp onto that, the better, you know, just being curious and opening the doors to opportunities, being open to opportunities, asking a lot of questions um, and realizing that things typically for most people don't go that smoothly can really help kind of put you at ease during that journey, I think. So thank you for sharing that as well. And Stephanie, Last but not least, what would your number one piece of advice be for people listening today? 
I think um, it would be to get out of your comfort zone. Take a job that may be a little bit different. If you think that you want to work in one area and you can't find that job, find something else because every position that you take is always going to be a stepping stone leading you to your final destination. You have no idea who you're going to meet along the way. Maybe you're going to be presented with an opportunity where you can actually build your own job. Maybe you're at a small organization. And I tell this to my girls all the time that work here. I said, we're a small organization. We've only been around for five years. Find something that you're passionate about and tell me what it is. Let's build it together. So not only are you going to be more involved with the work that you're doing, but you're going to be passionate about it. So I think taking every job that you are in, whether it's your dream job or not, whether it's McDonald's or working for the government or a wildlife center, take those as opportunities to learn as much as you can, take those skills, transfer them to something that you want it to be your dream. You're the only person that's going to be able to make your dream a reality. And it doesn't matter how you get there. You just have to get there on your own accord. Thank you. All the career advisors in the group are loving the get out of your comfort zone messaging. <laughs> We're very excited about that one. Thank you. We did have a question to follow up um, for you, Stephanie. Looking back at the startup of your rescue, is there anything that you would do differently in retrospect? Honestly, buy a bigger piece of land. Um, it wasn't in our, our, you know, our budget, honestly, to begin with, but um, yeah, we needed more space because we had no idea how fast we were going to grow. I assumed our first year we would take 200 animals. We ended up with 1,100 animals. So um, planning for the future, I should have probably done a little bit better. And that's probably the number one goal, having more land to grow, because I really never thought that what I just wanted to help animals. I just wanted to you know have a wildlife rehabilitation center. It never thought about doing the educational aspect and all these different departments that we now do. We host a festival of lights every year as a fundraiser for the community. Like we do so many different things that I never really had planned for. So I should have probably had a better plan in place. Thank you very much. Really good advice. And I mean, we can't always predict all of these things when we're trying something so new either, right? Um, follow up to that, would you pick a more accessible location where you're allowed to expand? No, I don't think I would, um, because although we are inconvenient and we're on a protected pieces of land, um, it's better for the animals. And that's our ultimate goal is to make sure that these animals can be successfully released back into the wild, that their rehabilitation process is stress-free as possible. And if we were on a more accessible place that had um, public transportation that was so easy for everyone to be to, maybe it's not the best spot to rehabilitate animals. We're really lucky that we have about 400 acres of land beside us that's untouched so it's nice and quiet it works really well for those animals going through the process so i don't think i would have made it more accessible if people want to be part of it if people want to volunteer if people want to work here they're going to make it happen either way and you just have to show people how right thank you <clears throat> um i know that a few students are going to be wondering this one and i'm going to leave this up to the panelists but we have a question about would it be possible to get email addresses or stay in touch if in case there's any more questions. I'm going to leave that to any of you. No pressure. Um, if you would like to offer up your email addresses or any way that students can reach you if they have any follow up questions. So we're already almost out of time and I didn't even get to ask most of the questions I had sent you all in advance. So I think that that's a good sign. But if if um, if you're open to that, feel free to plop your email or whatever else you would prefer, however else you'd be. Um, able to be reached in the chat. Um, I wanted to take the last couple of minutes. I'm not going to get you maybe to talk, do something a little bit different. One thing we talk to students about all the time is find opportunities to engage or learn more about your industry. We actually host a regular workshop about this. What, what newsletters could you be subscribing to or what professional organizations could you get involved with or what organizations should you be following on Twitter or key players in the field you're interested in? Just quickly, can each of you type one thing or two things if, if you can't pick one in the chat that you feel is really relevant to your industry that really helps you stay up to date or that you feel people should check out or get involved in if they're interested in this similar type of work. 
Um, we don't have to go into a long conversation about it, but if you don't mind just sharing that in the chat. And while you're doing that, I just wanted to thank you again in the last few minutes that we have left. I think this is really valuable information for students. Um, I think that if uh, a lot of people that are here today are probably feeling like me, I don't think we got um, nearly as much covered in an hour and a half as we probably wanted to, and that tends to happen. Um, we get very excited, but I really do appreciate all that we did learn, um, and any of you sharing your contact information, thank you so much. Again, your time is greatly valued and appreciated in sharing your stories with our students to see that there are possibilities out there um, to do work that impacts animals in meaningful ways, you know, beyond what we kind of maybe grew up learning about, which I was the same. I thought veterinarian, what else is there, right? So it's it's interesting to hear and see the more you dig, the more vast the opportunities do seem to be and the more interesting they seem to be. Um, so thank you for, for sharing that and thank you for sharing your time. Um, do any of the panelists have any final words or anything that you wanted to add or share before we go today? I'll take that as a no. <laughs> so thank you again. I'm going to stop the recording in just another minute. Uh, I'll stay on if anyone has any final questions or comments, but thank you again for your time. I wish you all, I know it's only Monday, a lovely week. Um, I'll be following up with each of you via email and making sure that when the recording is available that you all have it. Um, if any of the people participating today and listening have any questions, about the event, you all should have received my email with the meeting link, so feel free to email me. Um, and if there's any feedback on the event and how you think it could be improved for future years, we'd love to hear that too. This is only our second year doing it, um, but really appreciate everyone taking the time out of their day to be here and join us and ask really great questions today. So take care, everybody. Stay healthy, stay safe, and hopefully the sun's still out there. I can't tell, but if it is, enjoy that as well. <laughs> take care, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.